Welcome to Royat Hill Community Orchard. Uh, I'm going to start with a history lesson. In the 1600s, this area on the map was marked as the dairy and fruit growing area for Bristol City. It's, only, it's about three miles into the centre and you could go and milk your cows, go and take the milk into town, flog it, come back and then do whatever you had to do. Um, by the early 1800s this was turned into a brickworks and I'm going to say Eastern was built from here. So the, it's on a heavy clay soil and what happened was after the brickworks it got turned into allotments and basically around about the 1830s what happened was as we began to understand things about diet and nutrition. Um, I'm sure lots of you have heard about the navy and scurvy and vitamin C and that was cured by giving them lime juice and citrus. Um, the same problem existed for urban industrial workers. Basically, well the fastest we could travel was how fast a horse could go. Canals were the thing but basically if you didn't grow your ve your own vegetables locally we didn't have the transport systems to move them about and wages for industrial urban workers were probably so shit that people couldn't afford veg anyway and so you had things like rickets and scurvy and so the social welfare legislation in the early 18 about the 1820s was if you did a housing development, you had to provide allotments. And allotments were the way that urban industrial workers were going to feed themselves and maintain a healthy diet. Um, this site, basically the developers hated it, and so they'd give people the worst bits of land. And having got the clay out and made the bricks and built Eastern, um, this was kind of too steep a slope to easily convert to housing in the early 1800s so it got turned into allotments. To make sure people didn't have rights you weren't allowed to plant any perennial plant because if you did usufruct rights meant that you had certain rights to the fruit uh, over time and clearly to stop people having any rights uh, no perennial plants. When I first got a tenancy for this site it was 12 pages long and every paragraph started with thou shalt not. The measurements were in rods, perches and chains and you had to pay rent on Lady Day and there was a whole load of completely obscure things that carried on right up to the 1990s. Allotments would have been heavily used in the Second World War, the campaign to kind of try and feed ourselves, dig for victory, I mean all sorts of parks and whatever was all converted to vegetable and food growing. Um, that generation that grew up in the war uh, they're all 99 or 100 years old now and they're either dying out or dead. Uh, allotments, they were the kind of preserve of grumpy old blokes. By the late 90s this site was almost abandoned and the council tried to sell it off for housing development. It was valued at three and a half million and uh, basically, I was involved in a campaign to try and stop it being sold. The easiest way to stop it being sold was to show that 80% of the plots were taken and rent was being paid. So basically, we went for a campaign to try and get allotments taken up and people on them. And I can remember getting a map and writing Community Orchard across these three allotments here. And I got special permission to be allowed to plant fruit trees. Um, 
you know, by, I mean, in the 1970s, that's when we got motorway systems. Uh, the M32, I can remember working on it in the mid 70s. Uh, the M32 going into Bristol was only finished in the late 70s, early 80s. Um, that's when we also got refrigerated lorries and air freight and whatever. And I mean, it just meant that you could import food from all around the world incredibly cheaply. A few weeks ago I went to the wholesale fruit and veg market and I bought a 12 kilo sack of carrots. Uh, they were called pony carrots so they're misshapen or you've got a split or a fork or they're the wrong size and they're perfectly good carrots they're just cosmetically challenged and that 12 kilo sack was £1.85. I can't even buy the seed for that price, let alone doing the work. And on a heavy clay soil, growing carrots is quite hard. So it's like veg became so easy and so available and so cheap that it wasn't worth doing an allotment. Um, basically, in the late 90, 1990s, that's when the term food miles was coined by a group called SAFE, Sustainable Agriculture, Food and the Environment. And they started looking at concepts like food miles. And basically environmental awareness meant that by the late 90s, people were much more keen on allotments. I was involved in a campaign to try and get allotments generally more used. So looking at the tenancies, trying to change them so that it would be younger people with kids coming here. So if you look around on this site, I mean, wherever you look, there's kids' toys and tractors and God knows what around. Kids kind of come down here, they jump on the tractor, pedal along, find another vehicle, dump the first and hey presto. Um, I was also allowed to put a compost toilet up and that's the well, it's actually the second compost toilet in Bristol that has been approved by the council. Um, the first one was at a community garden just up the road in Gordon Road. Uh, unfortunately, that one burnt down. So this is the oldest community toilet, compost toilet on an allotment in Bristol. Um, yeah. It's just trying to make it more friendly for families and kids. Um, you know, if you want to come down for a day's work on the allotment and there isn't a toilet, I mean, a lot of kids are really not going to want to be here um, and stay here. So we've got a compost toilet. Um, this particular area, um, I try and do it so that the beds are no dig or less digging. Every single bed I can stand across it, work on it, and I don't need to tread on the bed. By not treading and compacting the bed, I don't need to do regular digging. What I've done is the pathway, you dig that out and put it on the bed, and that gives you a double depth of topsoil. By having a bed that is on a mound like this, I get a bigger surface area so I can grow more things. Um, uh, south is there, so this is on a south facing slope. And what it means is that early in the year, as the sun's low, it hits here and on that slope, it's the equivalent of being in the south of France. That slope on the north side is much colder. It's the equivalent of being, I'm going to say, in the north of Scotland. So I get an earlier crop and a later crop. By planting in a, you know, using the whole bed, I'm getting far more than if I had a row, a path, a row, a path. This way, I mean, I can work on here and, I mean, all of these these mustard salad plants um, or stir-fry plants, I mean, that would have taken a whole row 
Um, and I'd, I'd still have to have a path. Okay, it wouldn't have to be quite as wide as I've got here. But I mean, I can grow far more. And I've got earlier crops and later crops. Um, on, so in this particular allotment, community allotment site, I'm trying to demonstrate various things about permaculture. Um, so, I mean, that bed down there is full of perennial plants. This is a tree, well, it's a tree cabbage, a perennial cabbage. It actually came from Portugal. Um, this one here, there's a fennel plant there that is perennial. Uh, this is Ditanda, which is like a wasabi-like plant, really strong taste like horseradish or wasabi um, it's a lovely flavoring plant beware it does go rampant i planted it here and i found it sent up root suckers all the way to well here it is coming up here and here so if you're going to plant that i would recommend either putting it in some corner or keeping it in a pot so it doesn't go rampant. Um, there's in this bed here there's a range of different perennial onions so these are called multiplier onions and the West Indian community particularly like them you dig it up and they're like spring onions you eat a certain amount and replant or split it up and replant and hey presto you've always got those onions uh, this one here is garlic chives and this one that's looking very sad is a wild rock and bowl onion in the onion family we've got hundreds of uh, there's about 90 something different onion allium um, plants uh, onion family that all have edible plants and uses. Um, here, I've got chives. And I mean, with chives, you can eat that, but to me, the nicest bit is the flower. I've got here, I've got sorrel, uh, which is, this is a French sorrel. And then here, I've got salad burnet. Um, so I've kind of got a range of perennials there. I've got other perennials in other places too. Um, like I've got globe artichokes, I've got Jerusalem artichokes, I've got asparagus. Um, there's a range of different perennials. Um, basically, uh, and these here are I believe they're called Dorbenton's perennial kale and you basically nip out the you know you have the outer leaves as a kind of spring greens whenever you want them um, and to propagate it you basically get one of these stems like like that and I would remove those leaves and then plant it and hey presto I'll have another plant um, in the future so permaculture for less work it's either having perennial plants or plants that self seed and I mean one of the plants I've got self seeding here is the chard uh, that's now about to I mean I'm still eating it now but it's about to go into flower and seed and I'll leave a certain amount to go to seed and then I'll find it always around this is another plant it's called teasel and it's part of the thistle family. Um, I love it because it's wonderful for wildlife, but it's also got a very deep rooting system. 
and so it's bringing nutrients from deep down in the soil and if I cut it and use it like a green manure I'm cycling the nutrients that I would have otherwise lost and retrieve them back to the surface. As a wildlife plant it's wonderful. If you look in there there's a whole load of water in the leaf branch. So at this time of year that's the best pub in the world for insects. It will then come and have a flower. The bumblebees love that. It will then go to seed and over the winter the finches, particularly the goldfinch, love teasel and I'm going to say it's a major part of their diet. Um, so it's got a whole range of uses. So I mean here you've got a whole load of chicory self-seeding. You've got a red orange which is part of the Chenopodium family which is the same family as quinoa. It's also the same family as a weed called fat hen which I mean I'm trying to get my whole weed layer edible or useful um, and I mean it's very nutritious um, and lovely to eat. In there there's another plant that self seeds that's called mullein and mullein it's very good I mean A it's good for attracting beneficial insects it also is a good medicinal plant um, it's good for chest and earache um, but it's also um, the host of a stripy caterpillar that's got a wonderful outfit that comes out in June July um, so I grow it for all those reasons and the fact it's got a deep root system so that it's bringing up nutrients from deep down 50% of all the mullein plants that I get I'll cut in as a green manure um, so yeah here we've got peas coming up and in amongst that well there's a bit of bind mead but there's a whole range of different weeds coming up um, some of which are useful um, the main emphasis on this site is community orchard and we have work days on the first and third Saturday of the month when life is normal and uh, I run a number of workshops generally it's always been the first Sunday in February I run a how to prune fruit trees workshop first Sunday of March how to graft and then throughout the autumn I do apple pressing and I make cider vinegar pasteurized apple juice and cider and between those things that's how I fund the community orchard grafting why do you graft if you start from an apple pip and you plant that it's been through genetic sex sexual shuffling so you have no idea what you're going to get the dominant genetic of apple is crab apple and it'll take probably about 18 years before that apple pip starts producing so you might end up with a stonking great big tree producing evil mouth puckeringly sour fruit that's clearly not a winner so what you do is you graft and you put what is a known top on a root and that's where the graft point was so the root will determine the size of how big the tree goes and the top because I've taken it from a tree that's already fruited I know what I'm going to get so you know the size and you know what you're going to get because I've taken that top from a tree that's already fruited it already has the memory of being an adult so it will start fruiting after a year or two so I don't have to wait as long I know what I'm going to get and I know the size of the tree the rootstocks all come, well all the apple rootstocks come from the National Apple Research Station at East Morling. So they all have M numbers and what they did was they got out hundreds of apple varieties 
planted them all out and they gave them all numbers and whatever number it started with that's the number it gets so M27 is the most dwarf apple tree and it will probably grow only about five foot high M9 is probably the most commonly used rootstock in the world and that will grow to about seven eight foot then it's M26 will grow to about 10 foot M106 will grow to about 12 13 foot and then M111 will grow to well it will grow to about 20 foot and then M25 will grow to about 25 foot high. Uh, the bigger the tree the longer it will take to fruit but the longer it will live. So here what I've done is I bought some root stocks this is M106 and basically I've cut it and coppiced it and each time you cut it you're going to get a number of shoots coming out and you mound that up and in this winter what I'll do is I'll go back to this undo that soil and I'll be able to get a stem with a bit of root in it and hey presto I can use that as my rootstock to graft on a top that I want so I'm producing my own rootstock here uh, that one's M9 this is M106 and I have other ones coming along um, so yes we produce grafts and my fruit tree graft for this year Is here and basically you can see where I've grafted it and that's the top that I want the root will determine the size so this particular one for me it's called Ten Commandments and it's M106 so I know I mean I know what I put on there and I know how big it's going to grow uh, and the same with all those so some of them haven't yet come so what I've done is left below the graft point I've left that to grow until I know the top has taken then if the top takes I can cut that all off uh, knock off all these bottom shoots and the top will grow and hey presto I'll have whatever it is that I've got um, not they're all they're coming slowly now um, do you know what I mean it, it takes a while for the grass to take and for the top to start going um, as soon as it does I make sure I remove any leaf low down if the top doesn't take because the graft was done in a dodgy way or whatever uh, then I just leave the uh, below the root to keep going and all I've done is I've lost a year but I've still got my root stock and I can graft next year this is a self-seeding radish now normally people eat the root of the radish to me that's a hell of a waste okay if I plant a load of radish I'll eat some root but leave it go to flower and anything that has a cross in the flower where's the best one there's one there is the Latin name is Crucifer, so it's part of the cabbage family. And I know that anything with a cross in it, edible flowers. Very soon, this is going to start putting out seed pods. When they're young, I can pick those seed pods and I'll get hundreds to each radish plant. They too will go woody. Leave it because I can then collect the seed and I can sprout the seed. Sprouted radish seed is meant to be a superfood that's cancer busting and 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 and. I mean, my biggest radish plant is just there. In the community orchard, I've got about 50 varieties of apple. I've got 
six varieties of pear, about eight different plums, green gauges and damsons. And then I've got some nut trees and cherry and, and, and. So it's quite a diverse orchard, even though it's a very small space. By doing plants as espaliers or cordons, I can get far more trees in than if I grew a few standard big trees. Clearly by having that diversity, uh, what are the benefits of that diversity? Well, I've got my earliest apple is Beauty of Bath. That is ready in July. It's not the best apple in the world, but it's the earliest. So I get apples in July. Um, it's quite a soft apple and it won't store. And then after that, my Irish peach comes on and early discovery is round about August time. And then September, uh, I've got a whole range of things. Uh, my last apple that is called Winter Gem and I can store that till April. So I've got fresh apples coming out of here from July right the way through to April. So I've only got May and June where I don't have fresh apples. Some are good for eating, some are good for cooking, and some are wonderful for juicing. So I've got a mixture of apples, and by having this diversity, I know I've always got apples. Now last year, I had a super bumper harvest so this year there's a bit of a famine, but I can still see lots of blossoms, so I know I'm gonna get fruit. It may not be as much as last year, but I'll definitely have some. Welcome to the other side of the community orchard as it now is, or community allotment. This side used to be my allotment, and uh, the community orchard is down that side. Uh, when people talk to me about allotments, they often assume it's about fruit and vegetable growing. Well, to me, that's number 16 on the list of why I have an allotment. My prime use is my sanity. I can come here and I'm on planet Zog. I've got no idea I'm in inner city Bristol. I can get lost here, pottering about, loving it. So that's my highest value use. My next highest value use is I call it my playpen. And I do all sorts of experimenting and trying things out. And then I grow a whole range of different unusual plants which I can then offer to people. If I give someone an unusual plant, to me that's much higher value than a carrot. Uh, this allotment site, I reckon one of my main uses is well, it's a kind of store area for me to have materials that I can then use in other jobs. Uh, over here, I've got a willow. This willow will go about nine foot tall in a year, and I can use, I can make a sculpture or a hurdle or something every year from this. Um, so I use it for craft work. Um, I use it for a whole range of different things. Then, I mean, I used to run kids' birthday parties here. And to me, I mean, I can't afford to buy kids a Nintendo 99 or whatever it is. Uh, but what I can do is invite kids here. They come here in the summer. They dig up potatoes. We cook them. They go and pick some fruit, whether it's strawberries, raspberries, currants, gooseberries, whatever. And then we sit and have a fire, cook the meal. And I mean, there are some people who are now on this allotment site who remember coming here as a kid for one of my birthday parties. And they've now got an allotment and they love it. Uh, over that side you'll see my wood store. Uh, at home all my heating for the last 10 years or so 
has been from wood. Uh, I haven't used central heating for years um, and that keeps me warm. Uh, I had a chicken empire. Uh, unfortunately, right now it's defunct because Foxy got in there and has eaten the chickens far too much. So I'm going to have to make it into Fort Fox before I get more chickens again. And, I mean, to me, it's a kind of really nice social space, uh, educational, you're, all those things are much higher value than just the vegetables that you can grow. Um, in terms of what I do again, you can see these beds are kind of arranged in the kind of mound on a south facing with a slope. I mean, it's almost like I'm harvesting the water and making sure no water runs off this side. Um, it all stays in and goes into the trenches and sinks into the ground. Um, I mean, if you look in here, this was to stop the pigeons getting in, but that is, this weed there is fat hen, part of the Chenopodium species, really full of nutrition. It's like a quinoa plant, um, loads of nutrition. And I mean, a lot of my weeds that I used to weed, when I, if I want to weed them, I then hurl them at the chickens and the chickens would eat them and out would come a gorgeous poo and eggs and God knows what. Uh, my chickens I ran in such a way that they were all about waste. I went to, well, chickens changed my life uh, by having rescued chickens that had finished their commercial life. Uh, yes I'd get them and I would feed them all on waste food which meant when I went round the shop saying can I have your waste they'd give me they'd say yes that's fine and I started collecting waste food for the chickens found that half of it was far too good for the chickens and started distributing it to people so for the last 10 years or so I've been doing waste food and supplying various different groups and people with food uh, I'm afraid I get so much that actually my diet is about 95% from the bins. Uh, permaculture is about doing things that are easiest, but it's a lot easier getting food from a bin than it is growing it yourself. So yes, you never heard me say any of that. Clearly I only eat everything from the allotment. Um, <clears throat> generally with this site um, when I come here I don't come here to work I come here to enjoy being here and while I'm here I'll fiddle about and do various things but I don't have here's a list of jobs for now I've got to do them uh, I potter about and as I'm pottering about I'll do odd things um, here We've got a comfrey plant, and comfrey has a really deep root system, several meters down, and it's bringing up nutrients from way down. If I cut the leaves, I can either mulch it, put it in the compost, or I can put it in a drum, like that one with a hole at the bottom, squeeze it, and out comes a juice, and that will be a fertilizer, which um, I dilute it like 1 to 20 and it works as a foliar feed now if you're going to do that generally with comfrey you cut it just before flowering or just as it's beginning to flower so that all the stems are soft and sappy this one is just beginning to flower and you'll notice that it comes as a spiral and the flower that is most open is always hanging straight down so in a wet climate like we've got in this country the bees love it because as the flower is down they get the pollen from it and it's got no water in it so they don't have to spend lots of energy drying it off um, but this is a Russian comfrey Russian comfrey doesn't set viable seed so it's not going to spread bigger than what I want it to 
and if I cut it five times a year it'll shrink a bit if I cut it four times a year it'll stay roughly the same size three times a year it'll grow a bit and spread a bit more so I can kind of manage it so it's just on the edge of the beds here um, I've got all sorts of plants that I like I mean um, uh, I mean this one here is fever few uh, it's very good for migraines and headaches uh, personally I reckon the way it works if you eat it it's incredibly bitter <coughs> and um, you, you go through facial gymnastics with oh god that's horrible and all that contortion means that you get the blood flow flowing to the brain and that's how it works that's my theory anyway I'm not sure that it's the official reason of why it works um, this is me elephant garlic and in between that there's some rows of carrot carrot gets carrot root fly um, which kind of damages and kind of cosmetically does a carrot in uh, the carrot root fly is not a very good fly and it goes by smell so if you've got a whole load of onion around it it's not going to smell your carrots and you're going to get a, a crop a wonderful crop with no evidence of carrot root fly this yeah. is a plant that's called uh, the poached egg plant for obvious reasons and uh, it attracts beneficial insects um, but you can also eat the leaf and the flower a salad um, it self seeds abundantly so once you've got it it'll just self seed around and gradually spread um, it's a lovely plant this one's another plant that's self seeded and which I quite in like to encourage it's called burdock um, I mean the Japanese love it because it's a really nutritious root crop that's got all sorts of good medicinal value um, right next to it is horseradish uh, once you have that in a plot you're never going to get rid of it and if you try you're probably just going to spread it so leave it and let it just grow and I sometimes use the leaves of that um, as a fungal treatment on potato blight um, Basically, horseradish likes to grow in fungus boggy ridden areas and so it's got something about it that can withstand fungus. So do that, soak the leaves in water and then you can spray it um, or you can like put hot water on it um, and hey presto, you've got like a tea and you can spray that and I use that on like potato and tomato to stop them getting blight. Um, here, oh, this area was a nightmare. It was really quite compacted and full of bindweed and nasty horrors. And what I've done is put cardboard down on the bottom to suppress the weeds. And then I put a little bit of compost, put the potatoes in, and then I put all my weeds on top. So it's basically, instead of a compost heap, it's a compost row and you can now see the potatoes just beginning to come through. Um, and here's another one. And what I'll be doing is as the potatoes grow up, then I'll just hurl more of my weeds at it. And that's like earthing it up. And it, I'm going to plant pumpkins in here as well. So by the end of the season, I'll have a lovely compost heap and I'll have potatoes and hopefully loads of pumpkins as well. In the 1980s, the chemical companies all started looking at all the old wives' tales. And the tradition, they said, was the water that's in here if I wash with it, it's the secret of not getting wrinkly skin, it's the secret of eternal youth. They used to call it fairy water. And uh, the chemical companies tested it, started using it, 
and said oh yeah it's wonderful it's an anti-wrinkle cream and what it has in is a few dead insects which have collagen and now every single anti-wrinkle cream has got collagen I'm sure not made from dead insects but synthesized and then here we've got well this is a thornless blackberry um, it's gorgeous really nice big fruit and it comes about two to three weeks after the wild blackberries have come this one here is a white mulberry and you can see the mulberry is beginning to develop um, basically mulberry nowadays you can buy mulberry leaf tea um, uh, well I guess traditionally it was used about silk and uh, feeding the silkworm and then getting silk um, this plant behind here is uh, it's a crotagus family which is the same as hawthorn it's a north american hawthorn um, it's got vicious spikes um, but i mean the fruit it's called uh, arnold berry it's crotagus arnoldiensis and uh, the fruit flavor is gorgeous um, it's kind of got fruit about that big which is about twice the size of a normal hawthorn berry um, uh, in here I got six different kinds of red American gooseberry uh, I've got all along that side I've got a windbreak of evergreens which are Eliagnus uh, which is uh, it's a nitrogen fixing plant evergreen produces fruit um, and then behind that side I've got strawberry tree Arbutus anida but basically this acts as a windbreak for most of my orchard and yeah. I mean the history of all those fruit trees that you see here this was all my chicken empire and behind that well as my friend had this allotment for the last 37 years uh, whenever I used to come and visit and I noticed the allotments becoming abandoned I gorilla planted all those fruit trees and when they came to want to sell the place I just wrote Mike's allotments and took over five allotments um, and revealed the fruit trees that I'd secretly planted and hey presto I've now got a lovely little orchard The gooseberry and currant family, the ribes family, is very promiscuous and it keeps crossing and you get a different species. This one here is called Yosterberry. It's thornless and it produces kind of fruit about that size. Um, it's like gooseberries and currants on steroids. Uh, lovely it is because it's thorn thornless. Whereas on this side, I've got Worcesterberries and they're certainly very thorny um, loads of thorns but really nice fruit as well um, by doing having different varieties of fruit it means i have a really long season where i get fruit and personally i'd prefer fruit to vegetables um, and so i've got worcester berries here and up the top i've got buffalo currants This plant here is, oops, is Alexander's, it's part of the, well, Umbellifera family, the same as carrots, parsnips and parsley and whatever. This is what, it used to be a favoured vegetable of the 16th century, Alexander's. Got a very deep rooting system, flowers loved by insects and bees, but I use this basically is a ground cover and to pull up nutrients from deep down cut it, mulch it and shove it on my potato beds and hey presto I'm getting all that stored nutrients this is a different thornless blackberry variety I've got six different varieties of thornless blackberry um, I'm quite keen on them as I look to this one this is a kiwi 
and basically I can grow kiwi and I've got a grapevine going all the way along the back there. Essentially, when they stopped the brickworks, they made that wall of the bricks that were made here. And so I've got a south facing slope with bricks in it that stores heat. So I can grow all sorts of crops here that you wouldn't normally be able to grow. Um, because it's a microclimate and I get all that extra heat. This whole bed here, it's kind of a medicinal bed. And I mean, here I've got sage. How many uses can I think of for sage? Oh dear me, millions. Um, I mean, the North American Indians used to use sage stick as a they'd kind of smoke a house and that would, they'd say, cleanse it. Um, it's got all sorts of antibacterial properties, really good for mouth and throat cleanliness. Um, the reason people used to use it with eating fatty meat, like pork, is that it's a really good digestive and it helps your body sort out all the fats of things like pork. Um, uh, so things like sage, uh, yeah. if I find a new use for a plant and I can use it more, then I've suddenly increased my productivity without doing anything else other than learning a bit of information and using it. Um, that's an edible uh, honeysuckle. This plant here is a daylily, Hemerocallis, produces edible flowers. As I look there, I used to have bees. Uh, I'm afraid uh, my bees have suffered a bit. Um, oh, look at that comfrey in perfect condition. It's just a little bit ahead of what's down below there because um, it's getting more heat, more light. So it's flowering a few days earlier than plants lower down. You can see my grapevines going all the way along the top there. Kiwi down here and there I've got a fig as well. There's a bamboo there. It produces edible shoots. You've got to get them when they're really young and tender. Um, but otherwise I use it for all sorts of stakes and building and whatever. Um, so I've got bee hut and then the fruit and orchard keeps on going down that way. This is a pheromone trap for plum maggot and for uh, codling moth, which is the, the maggots that you get inside apples. So to stop that, round about April, April time, just as you get flowering going on, uh, basically that little thing there puts out the essence of female on heat. So all the male moths come in here trying to, trying to get in, have their wicked way, and they get stuck on the sheet. And so basically the ladies don't get impregnated and therefore I don't end up with loads of maggots in me, plums and apples. All under here I put this three-cornered leek. Uh, I have to say nowadays they're saying this is a plant that goes out of control. Uh, basically it's seeds and it's got bulbs and it'll spread. So you probably shouldn't plant it anywhere. But I mean right now them flowers ah, oh, really sweet oniony flavour, lovely in salads and the leaf throughout winter I can pick this, it's called three cornered leek you can see the kind of shape of it is a bit like a corner three cornered leek and you can eat the leaf as a kind of chive or onion substitute or, um, and it just goes rampant and spreads. I, to me, the allotment is about enjoying being here. And one of my favorite spots is here. I can rest on me hammock, get a bit of shade, get a bit of sun, and oh, I can have all sorts of wonderful thoughts or I can just fall asleep. Uh, 
you know, to me the allotment is not about how much work I've got to do, it's about how much I can enjoy it. And I love my allotment.